Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian Myers. I'm a director of product management for AWS's analytics group. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to LFS 202. We're going to hear about Gilead Science's journey in the cloud with data modernization and innovation. Today, we're going to cover uh, some of what AWS is doing in health and give you a flavor of some of the investments that we're making in healthcare and life sciences and talk about the journey that we see customers making from migration through unification and securing their systems in the cloud and then through to innovation with AI and machine learning and edge and IoT and all of the wealth of capabilities that are offered. We are going to dive deep on a modern data strategy and hear how Gilead employed a modern data strategy in their migration process. And we're going to dive deep into what they built and hear uh, really from the horse's mouth uh, how they were able to be successful with data in the cloud. For myself, uh, I'm based in London in the UK. And healthcare is offered in a very different way in the UK. It's a nationalized service. And as healthcare provision becomes more efficient, at least where, uh, where I live, that enables our healthcare providers to widen the scope of services that are offered and become more accessible. It's been a privilege for me to work with some of our healthcare and life sciences customers. Um, and that is my why for being here today and, and making my own small investments that I can make in healthcare and life sciences. So AWS for Health is a program that AWS is investing in to help healthcare and life sciences organizations to really reinvent how they collaborate and make data-driven clinical and operational decisions to enable precision medicine and decrease the cost of care. In the end, it's about helping healthcare and life sciences organizations, our customers, to make better choices about services and solutions that they can take advantage of to increase the pace of innovation, to unlock the potential of their health data, and to develop more personalized approaches to therapeutic development and care. And that spans the omics space as well as healthcare and life sciences. And a special call out for those of you who may have missed it, uh, we did announce a service specifically targeting multi-omic processing, Amazon Omics, which is all about being able to store, analyze, and gain insights from your multi-omic data through standardized workflows and data storage. So it's one of the ways that we're really trying to invest in this space. We provide the right tools and data and expertise to help customers increase their security and innovate on behalf of the patient across 16 critical solution areas in healthcare, biopharma, and genomics, and identify the right cloud technology to help accelerate digital transformation. And it brings together not just AWS services, but solutions that are built on top of those services from both AWS experts and AWS professional services, as well as our partners and healthcare providers and industry leaders like Cerner, Change Healthcare, Deloitte, Philips, Illumina, DNA Nexus, to name a few. With our partners, we're offering purpose-built solutions that accelerate across the value chain through R&D, clinical development, manufacturing and supply chain, in the commercial space, as well as compliance. And we do this through more than 1,000 third-party vetted global compliance requirements. We do this with more than 30 regions to help our customers establish global reach and, and data sovereignty. More than 50 global genomics initiatives that are powered by AWS, and more than 90 open healthcare, life science, and genomics data sets to help you accelerate delivery of solutions. All of our customers have to make a journey to the cloud, and it involves multiple steps. And the largest organizations will be at each of these steps at any given point in time. And we offer solutions and an engagement model that helps 
our customers through each of these steps, wherever you may be, and help you to get to where you want to be. The first step, of course, is migration, a foundational capability that allows you to move your applications and your data to the cloud and create a solid foundation for innovation. It is far better and faster for you to innovate within the cloud than trying to innovate on-prem before moving into the cloud and trying to do migration and modernization at the same time. This foundation has to be built on a secure operating model and security is always job zero for the systems that we build in the cloud. And so securing and ensuring compliance, taking advantage of AWS services that will improve your security stance where possible is typically the second step or combined with the migration phase where we have a good capability to secure as you bring your applications in. The next step is to start to unify your data and that's the key, what we're gonna to hear today from Gilead Sciences, about how they started to break down the silos between their business units so that they can explore new treatment mechanisms and leverage the data that sat within the organization in ways that perhaps they hadn't thought possible, leading to innovation through a variety of techniques, not least of which is often AI and machine learning. A modern data strategy underpins the unification step, and in many cases, we will fit in during the migration and securing phase to ensure that the left side of that diagram, those input data sources, are secure and that you're able to take advantage of the breadth and variety and volume of operational and application sources that make up your runtime estate. As those come into the cloud, we apply a comprehensive cataloging and governance mechanism, which allows you to identify the data, perform data discovery, and also push security policy and operational guardrails into your data, which ultimately will allow your business units to innovate and be agile, knowing that they're secure from the start. And around that foundation, we build analytic systems, we build data lakes, we build machine learning, and we build new types of databases that can supplement research or operational quality. The last mile is to get that data in the hands of your people, your applications, your devices, through dashboarding, visualization, notebooks, and in my own business unit, we're very pleased that we're now able to offer Spark processing within Athena, for example, making it ever easier to process your data at scale with tools like Spark. Crucially though, it's about closing the loop and coming back from the people and the applications and the devices into your application estate with better intelligent data to improve the customer experience, make better decisions, and improve cost efficiency or performance. The underpinning of this on AWS starts with Amazon S3, a highly scalable object storage platform designed for very high durability and with a very low cost profile, allowing you to store all the types of data that you may have within your organization and use it for a variety of purposes. Sitting around that foundation of data storage we catalog data with AWS Glue Data Catalog, and we apply permissions and governance through AWS Lake Formation. The last step is to get started with data discovery and data exploration with tools like Amazon Athena, which is serverless SQL and serverless Spark. No need to do capacity planning, and you only pay for the data that you process at any given point in time. And sitting around that then, we have a purpose-built strategy, purpose-built databases and purpose-built services that allow you to solve a given problem with the right tool, where right is defined by the type of data or the skills that you have within your organization, or simply how you choose to approach a problem. For example, for operational data sources and powering your applications, we offer Amazon Aurora, a managed relational database service with extremely high resilience and availability that scales far, 
further than you can with typical relational databases. Or DynamoDB, which is a fully managed NoSQL database that offers predictable latency at virtually any scale. For analytics, you may use the OpenSearch service to do operational analytics and search on top of log and instrumentation data. You may use Athena, as we mentioned, for serverless query from business analysts or data stewards to explore their data, or build customized pipelines in services like Amazon EMR or AWS Glue. Amazon Redshift provides fully managed, cluster-based and serverless, columnar, parallel data warehouse capabilities where all of this data can then be trafficked into the SageMaker family of services to allow you to perform AI and machine learning. And the integration that goes around is secured by a consistent permissions model and access to data. A key focus area across all of our data services, first and foremost, is security, durability, and availability. Your data has to be secure, it has to be accessible, and it has to be ensured to be correct at all times. We continue to make investments in simplicity and ease of use. For example, our announcement around Amazon Data Zone facilitates data access and exploration by business analysts in ways that uh, previously were more difficult to achieve. And we'll continue that thread of reducing the operational overhead for systems at scale and make these very powerful data systems very easy to use for your end users. A key differentiator of AWS is price performance. It's something we're very passionate about. And in order to operate at scale, we have to offer you as compelling a price performance ratio as possible. So we measure ourselves relentlessly on continuing to offer better performance over time and continuing to focus on that price performance ratio within all of our services. Data connectivity and integration is also a key priority for AWS and a renewed investment you saw this morning in Swami's keynote about an app flow now offering more than 50 connectors to SaaS applications. And that's complemented by AWS Glue with more than 120 connectors and services like EMR that allow you to create any type of connector to any type of system that you may need. And finally, a major theme that you'll hear about today and consistently, I think, across the week from our customers is around data governance. The ability to understand what data you have, to classify that data, to make it available to your various business units, and to get the benefit of that data while maintaining an extremely high standard of security. Often data governance and agility are viewed as being in tension. That doesn't have to be the case. And data mesh is one of the patterns that we see customers pursuing that allow them to maintain a very, very strong security stance while allowing their business units to be agile and innovate. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mark Burson, who's the CIO for Gilead Sciences, who's going to start talking about the journey that they've been on. Thanks, Ian. So, uh, so why am I here? What is my why? Um, I am passionate about advancing cures to life-threatening diseases through the use of cloud innovation and analytics. Um, Gilead Sciences, I'm proud to represent Gilead Sciences as uh, the Chief Information Officer. Um, Gilead Sciences is um, a pharma company about 35 years old, uh, couple major therapeutic areas, um, virology, oncology, namely drugs to address um, uh, areas like HIV, triple negative breast cancer, hepatitis, uh, et cetera. And Gilead is really infamous for tackling some of the world's most challenging disease areas and not just pursuing um, treatment, but in some cases pursuing um, cures, as is uh, the case with hepatitis C. And we firmly believe that um, the industry uh, and our company is, is being disrupted, and data science um, and 
cloud innovation is really going to be key to um, continuing our uh, pursuit of these innovative medicines for, um, for patients. So um, as Ian described, we really think about um, our cloud journey in, in four major areas. Uh, I'm gonna cover the migrate, secure, and, and comply experience that we've had along that journey and then hand it off to a colleague of mine, Morali, um, who's gonna handle um, the unify and innovate um, you can see the words here that we're leapfrogging others by being one of the fastest life sciences companies to move to the cloud. Uh, I'll, I'll put an asterisk after that and say that we got off to a slow start. Um, we, we, uh, we started this journey just a couple of years ago, um, and I'll explain you know, why we, uh, we were a little bit um, late to the game. But um, over the last couple of years, uh, we have deliberately accelerated that migration. Um, we've moved uh, approximately 70% of our data center footprint and, and uh, data workloads into the cloud over the last 20 months or so. Um, you know, and, and our landscape looked like, I'm sure, what many of uh, your landscapes looked like or, or look like now in terms of uh, you know, thousands of virtual machines in our, in our data center running um, hundreds and hundreds of, of applications, uh, dozens of enterprise applications, many um, highly regulated uh, applications and, and workloads as we're in a highly regulated industry, um, hundreds of data sets, uh, tens of thousands of users, um, and, and in some cases, um, applications sprawl, particularly in, uh, in the analytics space. Um, Morali, my colleague, leads uh, BI and, and analytics as well as our cloud journey, and um, I've challenged him to reduce our footprint in, uh, in our BI tools, um, and moving to the cloud is one mechanism uh, for us uh, to do that. So why did we embark upon this journey? Uh, again, I'm sure it's not an uncommon um, story. We, um, we wanted greater agility. Uh, we wanted to move faster and support our business stakeholders like our data science community to be able to innovate um, faster, discover drugs faster, bring them to market faster with higher efficacy. Um, we also wanted to increase our operational resilience. Um, one of the reasons, you know, very, very pragmatically was uh, we identified a gap in our business resilience. Um, we had a primary data center, a backup and disaster recovery data center. Our backup disaster recovery data center wasn't fully scaled to meet the needs of a, you know, uh, of a full failover in the, in the event of, of a disaster. So we were forced with a decision of, you know, do we invest a lot in, in CapEx to upscale our backup disaster recovery data center, or do we accelerate our migration out of the data center uh, to the cloud and then pursue um, cloud-based uh, disaster recovery with you know, services like Cloud Endure? We obviously opted um, for the latter, so there was uh, a financial implication of, uh, of avoiding that capex, as well as increasing, um, increasing the resiliency in the process. So um, that's a little bit about you know, um, why we got started, why did we choose AWS? Um, you know, what, what I would say is that, uh, like many of you, you assess, you know, the, the technical capabilities. And we did assess the technical capabilities of um, AWS to be uh, a leader in the space, um, as are other dimensions, like the partner ecosystem and customer ecosystem uh, that, that we see here at the conference, security, um, you know, et cetera. But I would say that the primary reason um, why we chose AWS was their passion for disruptive transformation, um, which, you know, we have a passion with in, um, in the life sciences space. So, you know, we had discussions around um, uh, disrupting the way clinical trials are performed, disrupting the way molecules are, are discovered, as opposed to discussions around, you know, lifting and shifting workloads. Of course, you know, as you progress down the journey, there, there are, you know, some steps that are tactical, some steps that are more strategic. Morali will cover, you know, more of the uh, strategic innovation um, that, that we're now able to focus on 
uh, by creating this foundation of going through the migration and, and securing comply phases as, um, as Ian highlighted. So, you know, to us, it's, uh, it, it is both feature function and technical viability, but it's also, you know, we want a strategic partner that we really think is going to be a good partner. Um, and, uh, and AWS fit that profile for us. So um, how does that manifest? Like what, what does being a good partner um, look like? Um, willingness to in, invest in co-innovation. Um, so uh, we do a lot of exploring of, of uh, potential use cases, um, a lot of working backwards as, you know, as the infamous you know, Amazon methodology um, uh, you know, um, is, is built around. So uh, we, we do have a culture of co-innovation and, and you know, we translate that into really specific um, initiatives. The second is not only focusing on the technical aspects of, of cloud enablement, um, but also uh, capabilities that you know, um, are unique to the industry. So um, we, we do feel that AWS has strong um, industry capabilities in healthcare and life sciences that they brought to the table. And then of course, the the people, probably the most important uh, part, which is helping us to establish a data-driven culture uh, across our organization, obviously, which we think will ultimately um, benefit our patients. So, uh, you, you know, in broad strokes, what, what did our um, journey look like? Um, in 2015, we, we um, had very limited exploration of, of cloud. Um, and in 2020, which is when I joined the organization, I mentioned that we had um, uh, only 10% of our workloads uh, in the cloud, and that's when we really uh, felt like we were running behind, felt like we needed to um, establish a, a more um, focused migration acceleration program. And uh, like I said, uh, 2020 and 2021 uh, were really migration focused, moving from 10% to 70%. 2022 is when we kind of uh, turned the corner and um, you know, feel like we reached a tipping point in terms of our focus. Uh, and, and that change in focus has really evolved to um, optimization of what we have now already moved to the cloud, right? So I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, optimizing consumption, uh, optimizing cost, um, and pursuing automation to really realize the benefits of being in the cloud, um, like self-provisioning, um, for example. Um, and uh, like any journey, you see some you know, immediate benefits with uh, low-hanging fruit, and then some benefits uh, take, uh, take longer to realize. Um, one example of um, you know, some low-hanging fruit that, that we saw was uh, we are also going through an SAP um, ERP transformation with S4 HANA. Um, you know, it's not that sexy, but managing the, the non-production environments can be tricky uh, in an SAP transformation. Dev, test, QA, N plus one, N plus two, qualification and verification environments. We wanted to spin up, spin down, only pay for, you know, what we use when we use it. And uh, that agility, you know, was really facilitated by our migration of these SAP workloads uh, to, uh, to AWS. So, uh, why didn't we do this earlier? Why do we, you know, get a little bit of a late start? And, and of course, with any journey, there, there are barriers. And, and some of these barriers uh, are real, and some of them are perception. One, you know, barrier uh, around perception that we wanted to highlight was uh, perception of GXP compliance. So um, GXP stands for good practice. Could be good manufacturing practice good clinical practice, good laboratory practice. It's essentially um, the regulations and auditability of those regulations that you need to comply with in, in the life sciences industry through the FDA and so forth. Um, and there was a perception that the hyperscalers weren't ready for prime time with um, supporting that level of regulatory requirements and, audit and auditability requirements at the infrastructure layer because these GXP requirements do have implications at, uh, at the infrastructure layer. Um, but when we really dug uh, into that and, and got into uh, fact versus fiction, um, you know, th there, uh, there were pre-qualified 
uh, uh, approaches and, and environments and, and frameworks for us to use. Uh, and, and we kind of put that perception uh, to bed and you know, we're able to uh, forge forward with, um, with, with our migration and focus. So um, how do we think about the value? How do we measure this value? Um, you know, obviously there's an operational productivity uh, element. I mentioned operational resiliency. I also mentioned um, agility. We have, you know, this is a big investment for us, both in, in terms of uh, money, but also probably more important in, in terms of time and, and focus. Uh, so we do have quantifiable uh, uh, operational improvement measures as well as financial improvement measures. I, I mentioned, um, you know, CapEx avoidance with disaster recovery. Uh, we have seen some um, software asset consolidation through the leverage of native cloud services. Um, we've also seen cycle time uh, improvements in terms of uh, the way that we enable the speed of innovation uh, for, for our teams. Um, and you know, this is uh, the foundation to build on in terms of really pursuing hyper automation. Uh, we don't just wanna maintain GXP compliance, we want to significantly automate, streamline, and reduce the burden of GXP compliance. And we really feel like moving uh, to the cloud is uh, going to be able to enable that for us. So, um, you know, what is our vision? Um, you know, I, I won't go through uh, all of it, but um, like, you know, like many, we, we want to move uh, to serverless compute. Um, Morali is going to talk a lot about uh, data democratization. Uh, we have, um, you know, over 350 data sets, some external uh, data sets, real world evidence data, uh, you know, clinical trial data, some, biz some internal business operations data that we've ingested to our enterprise data platform based on this data mesh architecture uh, that we run in AWS, uh, 2.5 petabytes worth of uh, data uh, flowing through that platform, uh, all in the pursuit of democratizing data uh, for use to ser you know, better serve our, um, our patients. And sustainability, um, uh, like many companies, you know, sustainability is, is high on our agenda. And like uh, Adam mentioned, um, uh, you know, moving to the cloud is a big play uh, for reducing carbon footprint based on the efficiency by which AWS runs, uh, runs their environment versus, uh, you know, a typical U.S. data center and, uh, and the carbon that they generate. So um, uh, I'm going to hand it over uh, to my colleague, Morali, uh, to cover the Unify and, and innovation portions of our journey with a particular focus on uh, data and analytics. Um, now, if you consider golf work, I'm going to introduce the hardest working individual that you've ever met, Morali Vertacho. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I have the best job at Gilead and uh, a great team. That's why I'm able to play golf. So here's my why. Even in a highly regulated biopharma industry, the confluence of cloud data analytics can increase the pace of innovation and accelerate drug discovery, development, and commercialization. When it comes to data, enterprises of all sizes are experiencing exponential growth in data in terms of volumes of data, types of data sources, number of data sources, as well as both in structured and unstructured data. However, to manage this data at scale, we must get away from traditional monolithic data management approaches and apply modern engineering practices and organizational models so that we can respond quickly to changing business needs and be able to collaborate more effectively to derive insights. At Gilead, we have adopted a data mesh approach so I'll discuss why we, pick, uh, we, we chose data mesh, data mesh guiding principles, the implementation approach that we started with to start the adoption, the top-down design, as well as adoption metrics, critical success factors in the, for the adoption of data mesh, as well as some key takeaways. Okay? But before I do that, I want to give additional context about Gilead 
Gilead has ambitions and aspirations to bring 10 plus transformative therapies to our patients by 2030. We have strategic priorities to expand internal and external innovation. Seamless access to trusted data is very important to realize these strategic priorities. My team's mission is to work with all the business units to deliver cloud data and analytics services so that the business units can scale innovation and empower a data-driven culture. We are working on several strategic initiatives. I'll focus on one, which is the enterprise data platform. But before I do that, I want to discuss a couple of examples of innovation on AWS. The first example that I'll discuss is the enterprise semantic search application. It's codenamed Morpheus within Gilead. Morpheus uses deep learning for semantic search and has capabilities to do domain-specific question answering. It has significantly transformed the way we do search within Gilead and find knowledge within Gilead. It has capabilities to organize data and result, uh, return search results across structured and unstructured sources of data sitting in various repositories and systems. Let's look at how it's built. Data from various source systems and repositories are ingested into the pharmaceutical development and manufacturing data lake, which is part of the enterprise data platform. And we use a set of data and AI services. We use AWS Glue for pre-processing the data, Lambda functions to convert the data to JSON format on S3. We also uh, generate metadata on a daily basis, combination of SageMaker, Comprehend, and TextRack services. And then we use Kendra to index the documents on S3. And our front end is deployed on EC2. And the access control list are maintained in RDS. The outcomes, we were, we were able to significantly reduce the search, research, search times by more than 50% while increasing the accuracy of the search results. The second example that I discussed is the Gilead Data Marketplace. This is for the external data that we purchase. Okay? The Gilead Data Marketplace has capabilities for data acquisition, but also for data sharing and the lifecycle management of the purchased data, but also a catalog for discovery. So these capabilities speed up onboarding, promote compliance, and promote reuse. The purchased data is then ingested into various enterprise data platforms within Gilead. Gilead purchases hundreds of data sets from 100 plus vendors. So prior to building a data marketplace, we were performing a lot of manual activities to purchase the data, manage the life cycle, share the data via catalogs, so a lot of manual activities. We have adopted ADX. It's a managed service. It manages the entitlements of the full life cycle of the purchase data. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we have improved the operational efficiencies. We have an oncology data set that took two weeks to onboard. We were able to do it in two days. Second example is we have a 38 petabyte observational data set that took 36 hours for data transfer. Now uh, about three hours, three, sorry, six minutes. And we get this data on a monthly basis, so you can imagine the amount of time we have saved. Prior to building the data marketplace, we were also doing a lot of the malware scanning manually, but ADX actually provides that service automatically. So our cost of malware scanning also went down to zero. The third example is the enterprise data and AI platform in AWS. The data platform has got end-to-end -end data management capabilities from data acquisition, ingestion, transformation, curation, discovery, as well as access to that data through a single federated query engine layer. The AI platform has got end-to-end -end capabilities for exploratory analysis, data prep, machine learning modeling development, training, deployment, monitoring, as well as automated retraining. While building these platforms, we adopted some strategic imperatives 
such as cloud first, automation, self-service, as well as agile ways of working. The data platform is deployed to seven different business units. And these business units have realized some differentiated business outcomes by using the platform. We did not want to just go and build a data platform. We wanted to collect the lessons learned. Prior to joining Gilead, I came from an organization where monolithic data management approach did not scale, top-down governance did not work. Similarly, we collected other lessons learned, right? When you take copies of data, it reduces trust in the data. And we looked at uh, opportunities within Gilead. Mark talked about the, SA, the ERP transformation from Oracle to SAP. So we have a fragmented data landscape. We looked at that as an opportunity. We also looked at trends like data mesh. Uh, also, within Gilead, there's a huge focus now on deriving value from data analytics. So those were the opportunities. And that's why we, we selected data mesh. Then we defined certain guiding principles like democratized access to data, minimize data movement, promote self-service, establish governance with cross-domain representation, manage data as a product. So let's look at data mesh principles and outcomes. The first principle is about domain ownership. This is decentralized ownership of data, the domain themes that are closest to the data, either to the source systems or to the data consumers, are the best themes to own the data. The second principle is about data as a product. It's about usability characteristics. So data should be discoverable, understandable, interoperable, as well as value on its own. The third principle is about self-serve data infrastructure. This is about reducing the friction for the data producers to produce data products and, be, and enable it to be part of the data mesh. So we have uh, APIs that we have developed at Gilead. The fourth principle is about federated governance. Again, this is about distributed decision making, where the policies may be set by a global governance council. How are those policies actually implemented in the data platform and providing the feedback loop to the data governance council? The idea is that with these principles, a business will be able to respond gracefully to change, increase the ROI, and sustain agility in the face of uh, growth. To implement data mesh, we, uh, we, we took a certain approach. The first thing is we identified a business unit. We understood their business strategy and desired business outcomes. And then we mapped their data strategy uh, to the business strategy, and then we level set them on the data mesh principles and outcomes. Then we worked with the business unit to identify a set of use cases. Then we picked one use case to deep dive. For that use case, we co-created with them a set of data products that would have to be created along with a platform roadmap. Once we identified the use cases and the data products and the data, product, uh, data platform roadmap, we first focus on the mesh experience. So this is about the data consumer. We wanted to make sure that the data consumers are able to find data products, share those data products, look at a scorecard to inspect the data quality of those data products with enhanced user experience. The next step was focus on the platform APIs. Again, this is about reducing the friction for our data producers. So we have four APIs. Once the data producers produce a data product, they use the APIs to register the data product with the mesh. And then as part of the registration process, the observability and data quality APIs are invoked, and the data quality is registered in the scorecard, which is part of the data catalog. And last, we focus on the infrastructure, where we use Terraform for the automation of the platform capabilities. Here's how it all comes together. There are three major personas in a data mesh, data producers, data consumers, and data stewards. Data producers, as part of the data authoring experience, are able to use the APIs to create and register the data product. The data consumers are able to, as part of the data product shopping experience, are able to discover the data product in the data catalog, request access to it, and 
get access to the actual data through the federated query engine, uh, and Starburst is our technology, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Right? And then with this, the data stewards are able to govern the data products by looking at the scorecard and uh, working with the data catalog. Gilead, we are still in the journey, the data mesh journey, but we have hundreds of data products in our data catalog. Now we have business, technical, and observability metadata in our catalog. We have service level objectives and quality in the catalog. We are able to provide row level, column level access, cross lines of business coordination, as well as description in a catalog. We don't have to chase SMEs to go find the information about the data. We have that in a catalog. Again, we have hundreds of data products. We are still in our journey. Data governance approach, again, a step-by-step -step approach. We do have an enterprise data governance council in Gilead. They define global policies for interoperability, data use, sharing, security, discoverability. Those policies are inherited and implemented in the data platform with a feedback loop and a step-by-step -step approach in terms of the first step being for the data onboarding. The policies are inherited to the platform. The second step is about transforming the data and identifying data quality issues. The third step is remediation of the onboarded data to, and curate it for discovery. And the fourth step is to ensure interoperability. And the fifth step is the ongoing data governance operations. Here is an AWS ecosystem of services that uh, we chose to build the data mesh. Ian talked about a lot of AWS services. As you know, there are 200 plus services available for storage, compute, networking, security, databases, analytics. We picked uh, several of the AWS services, but we also have two non-AWS services. We use Colibra for our data catalog, and Starburst is our federated query engine. What I want to point out here is, on the right-hand side, you see a distributed query engine. We have global access control at that layer. We have five different, five major uh, technologies that we use to store our data. Redshift, RDS, S3. Uh, we also have Enterprise HANA as part of the SAP rollout. We also have Oracle on-prem as part of the transition from Oracle to SAP. So data in all these technologies are accessed through a single layer, through Starburst. And fine-grained access control is provided at that layer. So our BI tools, our, or even we have a search tool, augmented analytic tool, ThoughtSpot, our data science tools, all connect to, through this single layer to access data sitting in five different uh, technologies. You can't improve if you don't measure. That is why we deliberately picked a set of metrics organized by a data mesh principle. I will uh, touch on the first one. For data as a product, we wanted to, our measure was availability of data products, but also user satisfaction of those data products. The metric is how many data products were published in the last quarter, or what is the average rating of those data products in the data catalog. Just like with any new technology, a new approach, having a vision, getting stakeholder sponsorship, educating the stakeholders is very important. But the most important success factor in our data mesh approach is organizational model, domain ownership of data, because those are the teams that understand the data the best, so domain ownership of the data. But also uh, cloud native skills to develop the data mesh and managing the change of moving to the data mesh approach. So here are the key takeaways. Gilead is realizing business value from data mesh approach. It is real, it's not obsolete. Mindset, organizational, and operate, operating models are the biggest barriers for adoption of data mesh. Educate your stakeholders, start small, show some success, and scale. As I showed, Gilead has adopted a lot of AWS services and a couple of non-AWS services. Implementing observability is very important to demonstrate data quality in the data catalog, and also implementing APIs and reducing the barrier for the data producers to produce data products is very important. An adoption framework, cookbooks, roadshows, 
All of that is very important, including metrics. Cloud native skills are also very important. And choose the right implementation partner to adopt data mesh. We are fortunate to have AWS ProServe, ZS, and uh, ThoughtWorks as our partners to implement data mesh and manage change effectively. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Murley. What a fantastic deep dive. And um, I have to say, you make it sound really easy. So just, yeah, just go do that. As Murali said, Data Mesh is absolutely uh, a real organizational and architectural pattern that can help you to drive agility from very large and federated businesses while maintaining very good high security standards and keeping the right balance of governance as well as independence for your business units. It helps you get more value at scale. The idea of data products is something that varies for each of our customers. And having a governance council that can spell out what is the interface, what is the API for those data products is really important. And they need to be aligned to those strategic goals. The federated governance is, starts with how you provision AWS accounts, how you enable services to be operated within your business units operational environments, and needs to be lightweight. It needs to be easy to change with your business units requirements and with your top-down requirements for data governance policy. But in the end, the focus is on delivering agility without compromising on security and driving better business results than you would with a monolithic, centralized architecture that can be difficult to scale and makes you realize that one size does not fit all. So how can you get started? Well, we're very pleased to have been able to announce Amazon Data Zone yesterday in Adam Slipsky's keynote. It really embraces a lot of the concepts and we've learned from customers like Gilead who've uh, asked for an easier ability to build data mesh technologies and, or, and patterns on AWS. So with Data Zone, you provision Domains, straight from the theoretical handbook of data mesh. You can organize your data into domains, which are federated across your business units, and you can apply policy for how data products are then fit into those domains. They sit across your business units without having to do a very strong and locked-in mapping to your AWS accounts. And DataZone then offers you a data portal that enables peer-to-peer -peer data sharing and a workflow around subscriptions, producers updating metadata and facilitating data discovery. And it extends and builds on the existing AWS analytics stock, stack. It's powered by technologies like AWS Lake Formation, S3 data lakes, Redshift and Redshift data shares. But it simplifies and provides you an organizational-wide business data catalog that allows your data producers to create comprehensive metadata, whether it's stored on the cloud or not, and then to apply that governance and access control in a more simplified way to facilitate the self-service requirements that your customers have. Simplifying access through this, this dedicated data portal. DataZone isn't the only way to build a data mesh as we saw from Murley and Gilead. There are a variety of technologies in the heart of data mesh permissions is implemented through AWS Lake Formation. Lake Formation allows you to create a relationship between your producer AWS accounts and your consumer AWS accounts, typically through what we call a federated governance account. The federated governance account or governance environment in data zone is the data zone endpoint, but can be implemented on existing stacks today with a uh, simple uh, pattern of organizing your accounts and how metadata is propagated around your organization. Keep in mind, this is not about copying data. That is cost prohibitive. This is about sharing just the references and managing cross-account security, whether that's a point-to-point -point grant of databases and tables 
or through tag-based access control, where you set policies that say who can access data on the basis of things like data classification, domain naming, cost center, legal entity, data protection realm, or whatever the case may be. There are a wide number of ways to build data meshes on AWS, as we've seen, including with our third-party partners. And we encourage you to read the blogs that we have on this topic, whether it's a general architecture or how it's been applied within healthcare, retail, transportation, mobile telco. There are a lot of references that we can point you at. So with that, we'll close. Thank you very much for attending today's session. And thank you again to Gilead for sharing their story of how they modernized and moved to innovation uh, powered by data mesh and analytics on AWS. Good afternoon.